everyone for uh, joining us today. Thank a very special thanks to the Australian government for hosting us uh, today, as well as for their leadership in making all of this happen. And uh, to recognize that leadership and uh, offer their hospitality, I would like now very much to invite Gushla Munro from the Department of Climate, Energy, Environment, and Water, or DQ, as we refer immediately to it, to, it, to come to the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are so honored to have you here at the uh, Australian Pavilion today, but even better, to launch the Supercharging Battery uh, Storage Deployment Initiative. And um, we actually have uh, an amazing uh, lineup here, um, many heavyweights uh, in the uh, energy, energy transition space. But I really did want to extend a warm welcome to the UN Secretary General's um, <laughs> special advisor for climate action, Selwyn Hart, as he beats away one of my staff members. Uh, <laughs> And uh, thanks to him and his team to really um, elevate the challenges and opportunities of the, the grid scale batteries. Um, this COP has been significant in terms of the, the tripling down, doubling up initiative. Um, and for countries like Australia, uh, where we are going uh, such rapid transformation of our energy and electricity systems, you know, from fossil fuels, for us, we're going to 82% renewables by 2030. We absolutely know how critical grid-scale batteries are going to be. But globally, um, there's a great IEA report, uh, and they, they put it at 778 gigawatts of new battery capacity by 2030. So this is a global challenge. It epitomises the role of organisations such as the Clean Energy Ministerial, about how we can help drive solutions. Um, and these, these issues are really complex, right? Uh, there's the regulatory regimes that have been built um, and value things in particular ways. Um, we have underdeveloped grids. We have concentrated, disrupted uh, global supply chains and these competition uh, for uh, critical battery minerals. So this initiative looks to how we can address those challenges and you know, the flip side of that is putting in good policies, good collaboration, thinking about supply chain diversification, ESG, safety, and you know, ultimately the, the innovation and efforts to also bring down the costs of um, battery storage. So just, um, you know, and we are so pleased uh, for Australia, but also working uh, with the EU, with Canada and the US to help lead this work with STEM. So again, uh, global challenge, big focus for the governments um, and public policy, but also so great um, that we have so many private sector uh, entrepreneurs, companies and financiers because we know that they are absolutely critical. So on that note, really look forward to a great session today and thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Gushla, and uh, special thanks to David Higgins to show how much this is a friendly crowd and how, you know, it's not, even though it's a formal launch, we can still do that uh, uh, friendly. Uh, in terms of how teamwork and friends work together, I would very much like now to invite the Director of Energy for the European Commission, Dieter Ewell Jorgensen, as the other co-lead of this great initiative, just to say a few words to us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, I think, by now. It is really an honor to be here to, um, to co-introduce and to co-lead on this important initiative of supercharging batteries. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, and I'm really excited to be here
So maybe with that, uh, I can start to go back, back to you again, uh, Isla, just because as the host, but also one of the co-leads, how do you see really this battery helping that Australia priority both of us? Thank you. Um, yeah, as I said in my introduction, um, for Australia, the 82% the uh, reduction in our electricity system is, you know, it's the heart of our decarbonisation journey. Um, what that has meant, though, is in terms of transforming um, the, this really complex regulatory environment that was built around fossil fuels and what you um, were asking of that system to deliver. Um, it also means modernising our grid. So for us, it's like another 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines. We're very large. We have a ample renewable energy sources, but they're not where the, the coal is, right? So it's completely different in terms of how we have to do that. And it's just the scaling up of the investment, um, which is being driven um, by some... Um, there's the regulatory changes, but also big contract for difference programs. But contract for difference, that isn't just about renewables, but it's actually about the, you know, the batteries and what we're getting out of that. So, um, and just, just sort of like last month, um, really big scheme. Um, you know, what, what was actually bought out of that was six grid uh, scale batteries, one virtual power plant. Like it's, it's, the, it's this great combination in terms of how we are going to be managing the grid digitally and uh, integrating in a fundamentally different way. Um, but it's, it's bigger than that um, and different to that as well in terms of community batteries. Like we're rolling that out right around our country. Um, we also have a First Nations microgrid program and so that looks at remote communities and moving from unreliable, expensive diesel generators and, you know, just fundamental equity questions. So um, we talk about that grid technology, but it also has applications and smaller scale and, and different communities. And again, this international collaboration, um, you know, it it's, can be hard when we're thinking, why are we at, at this meeting? Uh, no, always a pleasure with you, Diego. But um, in terms of what does that look like? Uh, in terms of learning from one another, and I think you tell the story really well, but also raising uh, and coordinating political action because it just drives us in different ways. So there's the practical stuff that we need to do, but uh, this ambition piece is incredibly important. Well, first of all, because we are committed to climate neutrality in 2050, we are committed to that significant increase in renewable energy arriving um, at 45, 42.5%, but better 45% in 2030. So a lot is going to happen. So my first point would be the sheer scale and pace at which we have to work uh, simply requires us all to work together. So as Selwyn has said, it requires cooperation, collaboration, partnership, and doing this, uh, this together. So that would be my first point. The second point is that we can see we simply don't have a good enough technology today. We have lots of technologies. We have the technologies to get us to climate neutrality and to lower our greenhouse gas emissions. But the battery storage technology is not good enough. We can make it better. So we need to invest more in, in innovation, more in technology development, more in technology deployment, and more in sharing that, uh, that technology globally because it is needed um, everywhere. The third point is the supply chain issue, which is one of the pillars of, uh, of the initiative, um, which is uh, where we need a lot of work, and the supply chains are global, and they should be global. There are benefits, there are participation from across the globe. And what we worry about is that the supply chains are not sustainable. We need critical raw materials, we need different parts of this input from across the world, but unless we become better at the circularity, the sustainability, the recycling, we're not going to be able to make it. There's simply not enough out there. Um, I spoke to one of the car producers who told me that 90% of a car battery can be recycled. 90%. I don't know how much of that is currently recycled, but it is very, very far from 90. And similarly, I guess most people have somewhere in a drawer an old cell phone, an old smartphone that they no longer use that has a battery, and that battery has material that can be recycled. So we can do a lot on that uh, in, uh, and to make sure that we have fair, transparent 
uh, supply chains uh, and that we work more um, on, on that, uh, on that uh, together. Um, and so uh, those are the main, the main aspects of that. We simply need this in order to achieve our climate targets and we need it in order to achieve our renewable energy targets and our energy efficiency targets. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, Secretary Granholm sends her greetings and encouragement and congratulations on bringing this together. Uh, she was at that roundtable indeed and very energetic. And we have lots of sources of energy in the United States, not least of which is just the power that explodes off of our Secretary of Energy's head um, when she really gets going, like you can power several cities off of her energy alone. The, the, uh, I, I, there is, so, my formal academic training is as a logician. This is a necessary condition. There is no way of getting around it. You do not get a clean energy transition in a formal sense unless you have long duration battery storage. Doesn't happen fast enough, doesn't happen across the scale of the sectors that we need this to happen. Um, and the exciting thing about this is that when we say we, look, we all compete and that's a good thing and the competition and the marketplace in batteries is very good. But the exciting thing here is there are so many possible platforms and so many possible technologies that can get the job done that we can see a diversity in the marketplace where we don't get in each other's way. And that's, that's exactly the right place you want to be to have the conditions for international cooperation. It, the, it, is, it is an absolute key to unlocking to net zero. Just to give the US example alone, like our estimate is for us to be able uh, to achieve our net zero goals, we need 1.5 to 2.5 terawatts of power capacity from long duration storage alone for our country. And that terawatts, right, that's a lot. And, but imagine like the draw again that that places on the R and for everything from the R&D community to overcoming the valley of death as soon as possible to actually getting to deployment. And that's where something like the Clean Energy Ministerial comes into play, because that's what SEM was created to do. If you go back to 2009, 2010, Copenhagen, when our, one of our former secretaries, Chief Stephen Chu, um, worked with all of our you know, legacy ministers back then to create SEM together, it was because he thought we needed in this forum and the climate context a foothold for energy ministers because of course it's gonna be essential. And that was an argument, right? Then, now it's a fact, and it's an undeniable fact. And that's what's so exciting to see SEM expanding into these, again, essential technologies. So we are, we've got a massive piece of legislation, our Inflation Reduction Act, a very large proportion of it is aimed in this direction. 3.5 billion alone of that, of the Inflation Reduction Act is aimed at battery storage. And we're doing, I mean, everything we can to, again, look at every spare part, including expansion of a new manufacturer uh, program in lithium phosphate iron batteries, like just as one of those examples. The stakes are enormous here, the benefits are great. I'll leave you with this. India has the most exciting story to tell about the success of solar. When Prime Minister Modi was elected in the spring of 2014, he took the, the then uh, previous government's solar target of 20 gigawatts of tw by 2023 of solar, he said, no, it's 100. And a lot of us, and I spent more time in my life in terms of countries working on India than any other country in the world, we all went, oh, well, 100's a nice round number. <laughs> but my God, look at where they are today. And when you look at their targets to 2030, which they just keep, regardless of what the NDC process says they have to do, they just keep upping it and upping it and upping it because the economics make sense and the capacity makes sense. If you had long duration storage to tie to just that solar capacity alone, India could be nearly energy self-sufficient. Now that is startling and that's the kind of world we wanna create and that's why this technology is necessary and we're very proud to join our colleagues in advancing it. Thank you.
Thanks so much, JF. Uh, you know, I think it's really interesting. Our ministers are talking all the time now about the fact that we've moved from competition to collaboration and the importance of working together both on the technology, but also on the supply chains, but, and also on the standards. We, are, we actually work very closely on thinking about what the standards are for the inputs, as well as thinking about the full value chain. So the recycling, the refining, the processing, and the extraction. We also, I think, have commonalities in the sense of the opportunities for communities. We, have, we work really hard on off-grid communities and trying to get them off diesel. Diesel makes no sense in any way. It doesn't make sense economically, for their health, for the environment, and storage is a really important part of that solution. I think batteries, um, I think we've all had lots of conversations this week about it's not either or, right? It's and. And when you think from a systems perspective, I really truly believe batteries are that part that gets plugged in that can make the connections, right? Like in certain situations where something isn't going to work and all the reasons something shouldn't be relied on, batteries could be the solution. Um, speaking of energetic members of cabinet, Minister Champagne was here yesterday and he has a battery strategy which has um, investors from around the world um, from all of your countries coming to the Quebec corridor for this battery ecosystem that's being developed. And it's in partnership with our indigenous communities, it's in partnership with our labor congress, because we see this as a huge opportunity for jobs and prosperity um, in, as the energy transition. So I think we think about it as a systems element and really core to advancing progress. Well, uh, thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, I think the first thing to be noticed here is that uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial is still and uh, more than ever fit for purpose. The creation of a new work stream, uh, so much connected to what is being discussed here, the political ambitions, the climate ambitions, and how to effectively implement those, uh, those ambitions, is, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a proof of uh, the health of this environment as a collaboration platform and implementation platform. And that's the kind of thing that we want to showcase uh, in Iguazu next year. Uh, we want to show that uh, uh, when uh, Australia, Canada, and a number of countries uh, have a common interest and that they see within this very competitive environment the possibility of collaboration for common uh, objectives, then uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial is the platform for uh, implementing that. And, uh, you know, battery storage is, uh, is, uh, is obviously uh, the topic that is uh, putting all this work together and, uh, and it's, it's certainly relevant for those countries that are pushing this initiative forward. But it's, it's important for so many other countries that are not part of this and will benefit from it. So I think uh, this is also another goal, is that we can uh, take what is being done in this group and try to, uh, how can we 
uh, 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 make this reach other, uh, other countries, other uh, stakeholders, and, and, and other environments. And that's the case of Brazil. So we are currently deploying this new policy called the Energies of the Amazon program. And uh, that's basically we have 200 isolated systems in the Amazon, 80% or so uh, fully reliant on uh, fossil uh, diesel, diesel generation. And we have the technology, we have the will, we have the resources, let's do it. And any, a battery storage is critical for achieving that. We all know that uh, that is uh, necessary. Uh, also, we are increasing the shares of variable renewables and that, that's happening all across the world. And uh, we know that uh, we need short-term uh, flexibility to manage that and bring uh, more reliability and uh, resilience. So battery storage, again, is critical for the success of, of these strategies. So uh, in that sense, uh, I think uh, this uh, new initiative, uh, this new work stream under the Clean Energy Ministerial is, uh, is likely to be one of the uh, emblematic deliverables that we are uh, willing to have in Iguazu and for that, I call the, uh, the countries, and we want to be collaborative on that, to uh, uh, arrive at Iguazu with a solid, a strong work plan, with a very concrete uh, uh, agenda. And uh, I think that is the spirit. Uh, I, I'm working now as a, as a, as a co-chair of the steering committee following the, the work done by Andrew Light uh, with uh, uh, very... Uh, strong uh, leadership and I, I remember your words you know every new work stream has to have a goal has to have a uh, a roadmap has to we know we must know very clearly what we want to achieve with this and uh, i think that's what we expect from the, from this new uh, work stream Yeah. 
Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So I'm the CEO of NG in uh, in Australia. NG is a, a global global company in um, trying to to lead uh, uh, or take a lead in the energy transition. And specifically on, on the batteries, we have just uh, commissioned this year the, our Hazelwood battery, 150 megawatts, which is the, the biggest one that we have in the group uh, to date. And what is, is really uh, an, an enabler for, for us to be able to do that is, of course, regulation. And also uh, the, the scheme that Kushner was, was uh, referencing, the capacity investment scheme, to especially to make uh, longer durations battery um, uh, viable. Because the, the one that we have now is, is uh, 150 megawatt one hour, is completely merchant, which works already today with the current uh, regulation. But longer uh, duration batteries uh, would still struggle um, uh, economically. And therefore, uh, that kind of schemes, government schemes, are, are very important to make it happen. Thank you very much to thank you very much to, to Sam, to Australia, to hosting us all. This is really important. And being in Goa and seeing the excitement almost matched the amazing energy in this room. <laughs> and we just want to keep it going. So have that duration of the four families of long duration. So the multiple hours, the multiple days, the weeks, the seasons, really capturing the value of 24-7 renewable clean power. And what this initiative is really elevating is the fact that three pillars are perfect because we do have market challenges, we do have public-private financing challenges, we do need to de-risk the transition with more capital to really understand how LDES is truly bankable. And the SEM initiative talks about battery storage, which is really important, but the diversity that was mentioned on the previous panel of storage, so short-term duration and long-term duration, looking at, the again, the four families, the thermal, the chemical, the electrochemical, and the mechanical, all of this is really essential to meeting our global decarbonization goals. And the partnership, you know, representing industrial companies around the world, representing the different types of technologies, the entire ecosystem that was also promoted, you know, part of this initiative, we gotta work on this together. And I also wear another hat as the chair of the Global Renewables Alliance and the tripling pledge, which we're really proud to be in partnership with the UN, the EU, the COP presidency. I just saw we got 124 signatures, so 124 countries realize the value of tripling renewables, and as was mentioned earlier on the panel, we cannot reach this without long duration storage, without storage in general, and so it is an essential component, and so working with them on this program, addressing the three pillars of financing markets, just an equal transition, taking this work together, I know that there was another one, yeah, <laughs> the theme. But I mean, they're, they're all the issues that we're dealing with daily, I mean, in the financing. The, the bankability of long duration storage does work in many countries or many islands, but not everywhere. And so this initiative will help us really take us to the next level to meet 11 terawatts of renewable energy by 2030. And you must have, you know, at least four to six terawatts of long duration storage globally, because our goal is eight terawatts by 2040. And that is a four US dollar, $4 trillion marketplace, and that's pretty conservative. So the economics, the security, the reliability, the resiliency are all here. So this initiative is fantastic. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks for also providing some of the input in terms of how to shape this in terms of what the real challenges are. Now, you, you ended on the bankability of a project. And it's very interesting because we have four fairly different types of financiers. Uh, so I'm just going to ask one, the same question to all of you. Uh, but I would really like to, for you to take them from the different angles of what you, how you see the challenges. What is necessary from private sector, governments, and others in terms of making uh, you know, a, a storage project bankable, and where do you see your specific type of capital being able to play a role? And maybe I can start with you, Ray, from a philanthropic point of view. Where do you see philanthropies being able to, to come into the, 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 the game? Um, thank you so much, uh, Jean-Francois. Really glad to be here. This is my last speaking before I take in flights, but this most important one, leave the flatlands because it's the energy storage. And most importantly, I think Andrew and the other same government officials just mentioned before, the reason we have this initiative is about collaboration in actions. I think that's the value of the initiative. Uh, I want to remind, remind everyone and also myself again, again, again. If you talk about technology itself, I think a lot of country industry you can deal by yourself. 
but how we can accelerate, speed up, scale up, that we need the SAM as an implementation platform to do that. So I'm really uh, supportive of the SAM. This government sitting on the table, leading the policy and regulatory framework, and the different financiers, uh, different uh, risk of capital can support in a different way. So that's my first uh, framing. But uh, back to Salvin's earlier point, this 1.5 degree, that's our North Star. And when we did the global store taking, we see the, the coal still in the system. Uh, we see from Paris to now, uh, even though the new coal plant is reducing substantially, but the existing coal plant in the system is increasing annual average 9% every year since Paris till now, which means we still got a major incumbent power asset that we need to deal with. I think battery storage plus different kind of technology and the different user cases on a different location with the renewable energy is a solution. So that's, I think, again, government official, your policy, your consistent push for that is super important. And back to philanthropy support, we've been very flexible supporting this enabling environment work. We see uh, sometimes government will take time to figure out their overarching framework. But where we want can come in is um, to, to do some uh, testing, piloting, working with your team to see what is feasible in that system. So I think that's the most important. Uh, so philanthropy will always play a role. And second is um, sort of data and information side. Since we are in the transition period from coal, fossil fuel to clean, I think a lot of policymakers would like to see if we have the system, they have a coal fossil fuel asset, there are renewables, there are battery storage, what that means for the social economic system. So I think we're waiting to work with all the players to really track and make information available for the policymakers to make, really demonstrate and justify the transition coal to clean is feasible, is the social economic uh, feasible and also good for employment environment. Uh, lastly, we are waiting to try out different blended finance um, structures. I think that is uh, maybe we need to work with the peer here, World Bank, CIF, and uh, the private banks from the GFAN side. Uh, but what we have mostly important is no matter which fund was established, what the impact of the fund will still impact on the policy level. Otherwise, we can invest one, two, ten projects, that's it. Or you have a multi million, multi billion. But that doesn't mean you have that level of scale that we reach the 1.5. So back to the earlier point, in label environment, super important, and it's a super, super important from battery storage. So I'll stop here. Thanks a lot for that, Ray, and uh, especially for flagging that you know there are different risks that need to be addressed, and maybe different funders who can address the different ones. And then, so basically, Richard, I'll, I'll go back to you in terms of, of you know, as a multilateral development bank, where does the World Bank see its specific role in doing this? And I'm sorry to do this, but you know I am realizing we are getting very excited about this, and using a lot of time, and we did. We will need to be uh, done by, by, it, by the next 15 minutes. So if you're able just to crisply say, how do you see the government platform bringing the private sector and the multinational banks being able to help you achieve what you need to do in this ecosystem? Thank you very much, uh, Jean-François. And let me start by thinking, because this idea about how can we do more about battery storage, what is it that we can do, is something that we started discussing already when we had the CM ministerial in Pittsburgh. And it was in Pittsburgh where we said, OK, we need to develop the instruments and the tools that will get us going. So fast forward about two, two and a half years now. And I would like to, to give a couple of plugs that answer your questions. The first one is, and I found it on the web, is an op-ed that was published uh, about, a month and ago, um, about a month and a half ago from the Minister of the Maldives. You can look it up. If you Google Energy, Maldives, the New York Times, this is an op-ed that uh, she wrote. And it is based on work that we did in the Maldives on exactly displacing diesel with solar plus batteries. And you will see the interesting numbers. They've been paying more than 25 cents for diesel. And what we did is we brought in the private sector. We organized auctions. We did solar plus battery. We did get support from Canada, the climate funds from Canada, uh, my friends from the climate investment funds, and of course, ESMAP, who did the analytics, the design, the feasibilities. And with an auction, without the government putting a penny in, they got less than 10 cents. And now they are scaling things even further up. 
And I know this is very relevant for Australia, so we're waiting for Australia to come back to ESMAP. We need you there. We've been working with uh, your colleagues at the UK for the Pacific Islands Initiative, where we really want to do what, what you said, that we have to get out from a project-by-project -project basis and do programmatic approaches. And then the other thing that we did uh, is, and we discussed it, we started it in Pittsburgh, we discussed it and we consulted in Goa, is this report which tells you how exactly to do solar plus PV. And what accompanies this report, and I don't have it with me because it's 200 pages, is a very detailed power purchase agreement on solar plus storage. So the tools are there, they're ready. We're ready to come on our side with our de-risking instruments. We will need some more concessional financing to help with capacity building in countries. Yeah. And that is an area that we keep on working. And I think the CEM is a good platform. And all I can say is that demand is going through the roof. Results and success does indeed breed success. Prices are, are moderating back now. Things are calming down. And I think we have a great opportunity. We would love to talk more about what you're doing in Brazil. We, we have been doing it. I think we learned a lot on what works, what doesn't work, how you bring the private sector in, and how do you uh, target the instruments, financial guarantees, and whatever else we need so that we can really get the private sector in and ensure sustainability of operational performance. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks a lot for that. You know, as, as we often say, proof is in the pudding. So thanks for putting the pudding along. Uh, but also thanks about, you know, building on Ray's point about there is a value of blending finance to address some of the different issues. Now, Lewis, as a funder of funders, how do you see your role in, in this and, and, and how you can help unlocking some of those mechanisms? Uh, thank you. And thank you for inviting us uh, to be part of this uh, platform. You have been quite a leader uh, and, uh, you know, you have engaged us for a long time, I mean, since uh, you arrived, so we are very proud of the, what you have done and what you have done for the city. Uh, I think that the global director of the World Bank stole my talking point, so I'm <laughs> going to make a little bit of an adjustment because it's natural for us to also take pride in what the World Bank put together in the, in the Maldives. I would say that that example is when you can do uh, battery storage, you know, solar, uh, or PV, what, what you can do with clean energy in, in a very frontier uh, space. For that, financing, access to financing is, is very critical. But I can turn also to our friends uh, in, in Brazil. And I have the secretary here, you know, back in June, we approved uh, $70 million for Brazil to, to put together the largest, probably, project on clean energy in the, in the northeast uh, part of the country. This financing, what we call the concessional financing, which is basically the comparative advantage of the SIFs in bringing, you know, reducing the cost of financing, you know, putting to the, together, you know, the assessments for risk where we take significant uh, parts of it, that is a critical element uh, here. That's probably why you know, the World Bank could come and, you know, accelerate efforts in, in the Maldives and as a result have this uh, successful uh, example. So this partnership, for example, is one that uh, it's a valuable uh, lesson for everybody here to, to, to take a look at. The second part is, for example, you go to a more de developed uh, economy with an, an incredible ambition, as the Secretary put it uh, here, you know, a few minutes ago. Well, same, same idea. You still need to have, uh, because a country like Brazil, you know, it's still, you know, one that faces uh, incredible challenges for accessing this type of uh, financing. So, again, back to, to the point. You would never accelerate, you know, technology enabling, you know, in, uh, environments uh, here for business unless you bring the concessionality uh, uh, to, to, to this space, and that's what we do here in the SIF through our battery storage program, $200 million, 19 countries. We are still testing the grounds, but uh, we, are, we are very confident. If you can see the two extremes, so from Brazil to the Maldives, yep. I think that uh, you have a partner here to, to talk with. Well, thanks a lot for that great partnership, Luis, and, and also for, again, seeing there's another part of the risk that can be done. And then, and then I guess finally, then there's the, the, the big fish in the value chain, <laughs> the food chain. Um, so 
Saab, how do you see then the private sector being able to come in and basically taking to scale what the de-risking activities that the philanthropies, the multi development banks and, and, and international financial institutions can do? And what do you see an initiative like this that brings these different pieces together being useful in terms of bringing that private capital on board? Sure, and thanks very much. And this, if, if the energy in this room is anything to go by, we, we've solved this, right? This is an incredible high energy session, uh, which has been a joy to, to be part of in a, in a small way. Um, so I'm the head of climate transition at HSBC Group um, globally. And in my former life, I was the chief economist at Bloomberg NEF running long-term energy scenarios. And I'm, I'm very aware, and I think HSBC is very aware, that you don't reach those deep penetration levels of renewables without battery energy storage. If we're talking about 80% wind and PV, that's only possible with batteries. So hand in hand, renewables, battery energy storage, really, really critical symbiosis um, there. And we are active in the battery energy space, whether it's the supply chain back to mining of the critical minerals through to the processing and the manufacturing. We've financed a couple of gigafactories uh, already uh, and through to the, the, you know, the energy storage assets in the grid. There's two points I'd make, and I know we're very short on time. The first is the off-taking really matters for anything related to private capital. We need to be able to see how the projects are going to get paid and whether, and batteries are complex because the economics of them is often a stack of revenue streams. And that stack of revenue streams means that more projects are bankable, in, in, you know, can, can generate that return but it means that we have to analyze all those revenue streams, understand the risks of them, and ultimately put it together. But that's the fundamental thing, whether we're talking about you know, arbitrage, whether we're talking about long-term contracts, ancillary service contracts, um, you know, balancing services, congestion management, you can stack all that up. A battery can be a really strong economic proposition, but we've got to do the work to do that. And to be fair, a lot of the bankers are not so familiar so one of my jobs is to get the credit risk department comfortable with this stuff by saying, hey, this technology works. It's not magic, it works. We can look at a lot, look at a lot of different example projects around the world and increasingly those barriers are coming down and private capital will flow. Let me make one final point and that's about the supply chain. I think there are a few critical things to make the scale of battery deployment in grid systems around the world make, uh, you know, come to fruition, that scale that we need. One is about the availability of the, of the input resources. And while there has been tremendous change in chemistries that give us lots of flexibility moving away from cobalt, difficult parts of the supply chain, um, fundamentally mining needs to be a focus. And from the private sector finance community, mining is difficult. And it's difficult because it's associated with coal, it's associated with environmental harm. And what we've got to basically say is we need to put more investment into mines and mining and manage all those things at the same time, because if we don't, we're never gonna have the, the supply of the critical materials to make the batteries. And the second thing I'd say is about the concentration of the industry. Right now, 80% plus of battery manufacturing worldwide is in China. The similar sort of percentage, actually higher percentage in terms of processing critical materials. And, and so there is a supply chain risk associated with that, and diversification is gonna really matter. The good news is that Australia, Canada, a whole bunch of places in the world have got these critical minerals. The new geopolitics of energy is all associated with this. Um, and if we work very hard on building out those supply chains, diversifying, then you know, we can get to these volumes. But there's a lot of work to do in that supply chain as well. Thanks a lot for that, Seb. Especially flagging. To me, this is where you see the government and financing religion. Having the right regulations to make the business case, but also having the right ESG standards to make sure that suddenly investing in mining is not, is not seen as a bad thing, but rather a good thing in terms of local communities. And so let's hope that we can all work together on this. Uh, we're running really close on time, so we'll be very quick. We'll take one quick picture, and I'll invite Andrew Light from the USDOE to come and give us some closing remarks. Thank you to all our panelists. So Andrew, uh, I mean, if there's one person that can take the energy and supercharge it as we close, uh, it definitely is you. So please, the floor is yours. 
No pressure. All right. So, I've got three points to make. They'll be very, very quick. I want to just uh, underscore footstomp. Seb's last point on supply chains, absolutely essential, totally spot on right. You cannot care about the clean energy transition without caring about diversifying supply chains, full stop. No one ever wants to be in the position that some parts of the energy economy have been under with respect to narrowed supply chains currently still. This has got to be a top priority. That's the only way to de-risk this and make it, make it viable. So three points. First of all, thank you so much. We're incredibly proud to join Australia, Canada, uh, the European Commission, Brazil, to launch this. This is extraordinary. Thank you so much. And thank you for having the good sense and the wisdom, Jean-Francois, to have this incredible panel we just saw with industry, industry associations, private sector financing, public sector financing, philanthropies. This is the ecosystem that's got to come together to make this happen. Uh, Tiago was absolutely right. I have an extremely high bar when it comes to adding anything to SEM. Um, Jean-Francois knows this. Um, I watch it very carefully. Um, we have 23 technology and issue-specific work streams, 29 members. That's a lot on uh, this gentleman's plate and his incredible team. So to really wrap our arms around this, you know, it has to be the right one. And so, you know, it's, a, I think, a mark that we all came forward to support it. Third, I'm going to go completely off script. Um, the, the Selwyn and Jean-Francois emphasized cooperation, and I think that is absolutely right. Now, let me tell you something about my 14-year-old son, Milos. My son Milos is an incredibly thoughtful and committed anarchist. Anarchist. He is totally an anarchist, right? I mean thoughtful. He reads Kropotkin, Bakunin, Proudhon. He is 14 years old, born in 2009. The high water mark in his mind for his community was just before the end of the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona. So this is, this is a great kid, I gotta tell you. He is so committed. For Halloween this year, he went as Emma Goldman. I'm not kidding. I walked around with him in our neighborhood, he was dressed as Emma Goldman. Now, my son will say that the thing we need is mutual aid, and he gets that from the root, the intellectual roots that he goes in. Now, I'll say, we're still going to keep the governments because dad's got a job and stuff like that. But he's totally right. This has to go beyond cooperation, right? For this to be successful, we have to celebrate the victories where they come. That first of a kind, massive grid scale battery storage that's successful has got to be something we all work together as a community to make sure it happens on time, right? As delivered and at cost. So we know this is a good investment in the future. We need to support each other. And uh, I will come back and a very proud dad and say, son, I you know, talked about anarchist mutual aid at the UNFCCC and got away with it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. I knew you could do it. Uh, and so final words is please join us. This is collaboration. We all want to make this happen. Thank you for everyone who made this out and have a very good day.